Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Wednesday webinar, Verification Steps to Unlock Financial Aid. Um, this is one in a series of webinars produced by FAME to help students and families plan and pay for college. I'm Nikki Vachon. I'm a college access counselor with FAME. I'm joined by the lovely Maria McDougall, who's here uh, handling the chat. Um, and we're going to talk verification today. We're going to talk what is it? Um, how do students know if they were selected? What's required? But most importantly, what we're really going to focus on today is how to get the documentation um, in normal times. Um, I, I, it's so funny that we're going to be referring to this as normal times, but verification is hard. Uh, sometimes this is a real barrier and, and we definitely lose students in this process. Um, during a pandemic, whoa, those hurdles are, are even higher. So uh, we're going to talk about ways to get the documentation and really focus on that. Just keep in mind that um, I'm mentioning a lot of dates in this presentation. I'm referring to the 2021-22 academic award year. That is next year's FAFSA that we're going to be referring to. So just keep in mind the dates that I'm referring to are for next year's FAFSA. So we're going to jump right in. What is verification? Well, when students are applying for financial aid, they're providing information about their household. We're all the income the household has access to it, how many people have to live on that income, and how many dependents are in college. Verification is really the process to make sure that data is accurate. So the Department of Education will select students for verification. The college is required to get documentation to double check those FAFSA answers. And if the student or parent made a mistake, the financial aid office will fix it. So just keep in mind, it's just a series of checks and balances. Why was I selected? We hear this a lot. Well, we know that um, every year there is a concerted effort to really try and reduce the number of students that are selected for verification, right? Because we know that during this process, we're gonna lose about 11% of the students. They're not gonna be able to finish it. They're gonna walk away from the process. So there's a real effort to make this simpler every year. Um, nationally, as of October 1st of 2020, 18% of FAFSA filers were selected for verification. Now, this is big news because since I've been in financial aid, which is since before time started, it's always been like 30%, right? A third of all the students that get selected, there's some smart logic behind it. Um, they're really trying to reduce the number of people who get selected. So every year, the Department of Education reviews their processes, right? And they try to see does selecting this person actually make a difference for a good bulk of the FAFSA filers? So they, they try to make it easier. And for the last two years, they've been using this machine learning model to um, more smartly choose the right people, the people that are more likely to have made a mistake. So there is a real effort to get the number of verification down. Because like I said, we don't want to lose one student in this process. Um, for Maine, we have about 24% of our undergraduate students who are selected, so we're a little bit higher than the national average, but, you know, we're still in the year, so that might even out. Um, some colleges choose for their policy to, to verify everybody, 100% of their applicants, or maybe even just sometimes if something looks a little weird, um, they might say, we're going to select you. They have the authority to do that, so keep in mind Schools are required to verify those ones that they choose, but the school may go above and beyond that. This may not mean the student or parent did anything wrong. Um, sometimes it's just a difference from one year to the next, like maybe they now have two in college instead of just one. That might be enough to trigger a verification selection, but we don't know. We don't know what the criteria is they use. They keep that under wraps, but what we do know is that when students are in the FAFSA, if they're able to link out to the IRS and pull in that tax data, it's pulling in that information directly from the IRS so we know it's accurate. They are much less likely to be selected for verification. So when I'm working with a student or parent, I can tell you, I'm trying like the Dickens to make this work. I mean, sometimes it's not always gonna work, but I'm always trying to make sure I can get them to link to the IRS if they filed a tax return because it's gonna make their path simpler down the road. 
Okay, so how did they know they were selected for verification? Well, students a few days after they file their FAFSA, they can log back in to FAFSA.gov and they can click on view your student aid report. Um, this is just a one page summary of everything on the FAFSA, but it's great information. So I have people go in and take a look at this. Now up top, you can see um, the EFC, that stands for expected family contribution. If there's an asterisk after that number, this FAFSA was selected for verification. But it also, um, in the comment section, which I think is fantastic, and I think it gets better every year, it will straight up say, you've been selected for verification. So this is where the student can know ahead of time. They've got some, some more work they have to do. Uh, so it just gives them a head, head start on some of their paperwork. But I also like them to look a little bit further down in the comments to see what you must do now. Because there might be um, something that looks like it might be inaccurate. So the FAFSA might say, look at question 28, just verify that that's correct. So it's always good to just read that. It's got some really good information. If they're selected for verification, I have the student scroll down that student aid report a little bit further. I want to see if the student or the parent were, um, if they did actually file a tax return. If they filed a tax return and I can see the amount of their adjusted gross income or taxes paid, I know that they didn't use IRS data retrieval. Because if they did, it would look like this. It would say transferred from the IRS and you couldn't see the numbers. So keep in mind, if I see that they have not yet linked out to the IRS, I'm gonna have them go back to the homepage, click on make corrections and we'll try to make that, that data match work. So a little bit of a work ahead they can do. Sometimes the first time the student ever knows they were selected for verification is um, they get a letter from the college. This is WCCC's letter saying, you've been selected. Here are the documents that we need. Once we get those documents back and we know that your FAFSA is correct, then we're gonna send you a financial aid offer. Some colleges do it a little bit differently. They might send an estimated award with a list of the documents they need and then if there's any changes to the FAFSA, the school will send them an updated financial aid offer. So keep in mind that they might see this one way or the other. The school can do it either way. So if I know someone is selected for verification, I'm gonna have them start working immediately of getting their documentation together. It's a great idea anyway for you know, students to start this adulting where they create a folder that has all their important documents in it. Um, but documenting income, which is going to be a big piece that we'll talk about in a little bit. I find that this is really hard, especially from some students, um, especially for students who are doing this on their own, right? So getting the income documentation together can take some time. And with verification, sometimes there's deadlines we're up against. So I want to start working as soon as possible. So for students, I want to know if they filed a tax return. So for the next year's FAFSA, we ask about 2019. If they did file a tax return, I want to start getting documentation on that. Um, I want to track down their W-2s. This is for students, I think, the biggest piece of the puzzle that we struggle getting. The W-2 is that wage statement you get from your employer. We should start getting them now for 2020. I've gotten a couple already. Um, the W-2s, if a student doesn't file a tax return, they feel they don't need those W-2s and they, they shred them, they throw them away, they burn them in a fire, whatever. But we're going to need this for verification a lot of times. So I always have the students try and track down their W-2 and we're going to talk about how ways that we can do that. Um, just I want to really document that income. We also want to have a copy of the high school diploma and transcripts. That'd be great too. Um, for parents, again, we're going to be most likely verifying their income. So let's get um, a copy of their tax return. But a lot of times students um, or parents will give us the tax return, but not the schedules behind it. Keep in mind that there are a lot of schedules that go along with a tax return. Financial aid office is probably going to need all of those. So get that 1040 together, but any other schedules that might be included with that. Um, also, we're going to need W-2s as well. So that's a wage statement from your employer. So if we can start working on gathering all that together, this is going to help us in the long run. Okay, what is required to be verified? Now, like I said, Department of Education puts out their list every year in a federal register saying, 
These are the data elements on the FAFSA that you need to verify. Um, and they're putting the student in one of three buckets, okay? The V1 is the standard tracking group. I find most of my students are in the V1 group. This is where we're verifying income, um, the number of people that have to live on that income and the number of people in college. So that's really the heart of what we're doing. And these are the pieces that we need to check on the FAFSA that are correct. So keep in mind for tax filers, we have these data points to look at, but for non-tax filers, we just need to verify their income from work if they had any. Um, we need uh, the number of people in the household and the number of people in college. V4 is a different bucket. These folks, we need to verify their high school completion status. Um, they need to verify their identity and they have to sign what's called a statement of educational purpose. I'm gonna talk about all these a little bit more in detail. But I just want you to know that the V5 tracking group, I call it the whole kit and caboodle. This is everything from V1 plus V4. It's all of the points. So students gonna be in verification, they're gonna be one of these three groups. Okay, I'm gonna drill down a little bit further and let's start with verifying income. Are they a tax filer or not? Now, I, I've had a lot of students or parents say, I didn't make enough money to have to file a tax return. Now, that may be true, or the IRS may have a very different opinion about this. And I don't know if you know this about the IRS, but they're pretty specific. So on publication 501 on the IRS website, you can get kind of the threshold of where someone has to file a tax return or not. So for 2019 income, if someone is single and under the age of 65, if they made less than $12,200, chances are they don't have to file a tax return. There's many caveats to this. The, if they're self-employed, there's a whole different ball of wax there. But this is, I like to know, just the threshold of how much someone can make before they have to file a tax return. So it's always good to know. If someone is head of household, that means they are generally a single person, not married, but also have dependents. Their threshold's a little higher. Married people, again, a little higher because there's two incomes. So just keep in mind. So let's start with my tax filers. How do we verify those data points? Well, we have to get acceptable documentation. And every year the Federal Register gives us a list of things that the financial aid office is able to accept. So we can verify income one of three ways. Within the FAFSA, if we link out to the IRS and we pull that tax data in, those data points are verified. That's done. So that's why I really try really hard to get that IRS data retrieval to work. But raise your hand if this has not worked for you. <laughs> right, Maria? We've tried like a gazillion times with some people. We know what the data is that they're looking for and it just isn't gonna work. That's fine. We have other options. We can go in and hand enter the data. But if that IRS data retrieval, data retrieval tool has been used, that's verifying. If that doesn't work, the student or parent can submit a signed copy of their federal tax return. Now, when I say signed, I mean, you know, the taxpayer can sign, but if a preparer did it for them, H&R Block, if the preparer's um, social security number, EIN or TIN number is there in the signature, that is considered signed. Um, if they don't have a copy of that, I have a parent who I'm working with who's home barred down, couldn't get IRS data retrieval to work, don't have a copy of that 1040 because it went up in the fire, they can get a tax return transcript. Now this is a document from the IRS that you request. It's a, it comes um, in a couple different ways. I'm gonna talk about how to get that, but it's really just a, a summary of everything on the 1040. How do we get that tax return transcript? there are some hurdles here. Um, we can go to IRS, you can create an account with the IRS. Um, and once you do, you can have access to your previous year tax records. So I can go and look three years back and get my, a copy of my tax return. Um, I can also get a wage statement here. So like a W-2, a wage statement from the IRS has the same data as um, what's on their W-2. Let's talk about setting up an account with the IRS. So to do this, we need to have access to their information, social security number, we need to have access to an email, but they also are gonna verify our identity. 
And the way they do this is they do what's called a soft credit check. They're gonna, when I set up my account, they looked at my credit history and they're gonna ask me a series of questions to say, are you really Nikki? Um, they asked about how much my car payment was. They wanted to know who was the bank that held my mortgage. Many students and parents that I work with don't have a credit history. So this isn't gonna work for them. But if they do, that's great. And we're gonna keep going down the path of setting up this account. When we get to the end, we need to be sent a secure code to be able to finish setting up the account. They can send that to you by text, but only if your name is on the mobile phone. So for a lot of students that have a track phone or have their, you know, they're using their parents account, this isn't going to work. They can get mailed that number. I worked with a student early December to get this. We still have not seen anything from the IRS. So I know that the IRS is bogged down. They got a lot going on right now. And a lot of people are working remotely. They have the same issues we all have. Just keep in mind that this is a place where we can lose someone. Like this is another, this is where we can lose a student. Okay, let's just say that they got their account set up and this all worked. You can go and get a PDF of that tax return transcript. You can then send that to the financial aid office and that's gonna verify the income. If that doesn't work, we can still get a tax transcript by calling this 800 number, 829-1040. Now this is an automated line. They're gonna verify the identity by saying, what is the street number on your tax return? And once you enter that, they're gonna mail that tax return to that address that was on the 1040. But what if they've moved? I have another student that has moved several times. That's not gonna work for them. Many times this, this would work for me. So maybe it's gonna work for a lot of students, but it's not gonna work for everybody. If this doesn't work, we can print out a form 4506T. This is a form we're gonna spend a lot of time on because this is one document where we can say to the IRS, send me a copy of several different forms. This works for a bunch of different stuff, but we can fax or mail the 4506T form. But this also requires that I have to be able to have access to a printer to go to the IRS website and print it out. Um, it might be that the college has sent a copy, so maybe that barrier is gone. So the 4506T, we can print it out if we have a printer at home, fill it out, and then we can fax it to the IRS if we have a fax machine, or we can just send a copy to the IRS by mail. Keep in mind that if we're gonna send this by mail, we're now dealing with mail delays. So there's, it's gonna take some time in order to get that form. Okay, so just wanna stop for a second, Maria. We doing okay? Thumbs up, we're all right? Yeah, we've had some good um, conversations. I just wanna remind folks um, when you're asking questions, either use the Q&A, but also if you do answer a question in the chat, make sure you've selected panelists and attendees because sometimes um, the question and answer is good for everyone to see. So just a reminder there. Great, thank you. Okay, so I wanna also talk about getting signatures. Like I said, with the pandemic, um, we have not had access to all of the technology that we would like to. So um, there was a waiver for this requirement of getting parent signatures because we don't have access to a printer. Like normally I might be in an office that has a printer and at home, I don't have that. So the Department of Education said, okay, during this period of national emergency with the pandemic, we're gonna waive the requirement of having a parent's signature. Now, this isn't forever. This is going to expire during the payment period after the end of the national emergency. So this is gonna go on for a bit until we're in the clear. Okay, so let's talk about getting that tax return transcript. This is the 4506T form. This is what it looks like. It does a bunch of different stuff. But to get a tax return transcript, I just wanna point out that this was updated in June, 2019. So if you have some of these in your office, just make sure you have the right date so that the IRS won't reject your request. Um, questions one through four are just demographic information, name, social security number, Question three is what address do you want us to mail this to? And question four is what is the address that you used on your tax return? Question five is customer file number. Now this is an optional thing that you guys can put. 
Um, but um, Department of Education recommends putting the student ID number in here. So keep in mind, the financial aid office may have a stack of mail they're going through and they get this one form, the name on the tax return, well, part of, part of it's gonna be masked anyway because they're protecting identity. So is the social security number. Who does this belong to? Having the student's ID number in here is gonna help that financial aid office connect the dots between the two. Um, keep in mind that we, if we use part of the social security number in this customer file number, it's gonna be rejected. Okay. So in the middle of this, in questions six, seven, and eight, is what do you want from the IRS? Well, we want a tax return transcript of the 1040. So we're going to list the document here. And then we're going to check off 6A. We want the return transcript. I just want to point out below, there's also an account transcript or a record account transcript. These things don't have the data needed for verification. So it must be a tax return transcript for verification. In the bottom in question nine here, it's asking what tax year are we looking for? So we're looking for 2019's 1040s. So we're gonna put December 31st, 2019. We're gonna check off that we have the authority to sign and we're gonna sign and put the date and the phone number of the taxpayer. So that's this is how you fill out that form to get a tax return transcript. Okay, I did wanna point out that um, some schools were still seeing are not accepting a signed copy of the 1040. And during the 2019 Federal Student Aid Conference, the Department of Education said you can't do that. You can't blanket say, we're not accepting 1040s because the department says you can. So if for some reason, the school feels that that 1040 is inaccurate, the school can say, I need the tax return transcript. So they can actually say that, but you must put in the student's file why you are asking for the tax return transcript. Um, you must document that. Okay. What about those people that filed an extension? I feel like this is gonna be a lot of people this year. They couldn't get their taxes done by the April 15th deadline, even later this year, but keep in mind, many people didn't have access to documents or what they needed to file taxes. So they couldn't get it done on time. So they asked the IRS for more time. They asked for an extension. Um, the IRS will just grant you that automatically. They'll give you six months. So keep in mind for 2019 taxes, the tax deadline, we have six months after that in order to get those taxes filed. And for many people, when the FAFSA opens, they've had time enough to file their tax return. So it's not usually an issue, but some people with really complicated taxes, like if they have a business or if, I don't know, there's a pandemic going on and they are really struggling to get this done, um, they can ask the IRS for more time. They still can go through verification, but what the school needs is a copy of the approval that the IRS gave them more time than the automatic extension. We need to verify they actually didn't file taxes. So they're gonna ask for a verification of non-filing letter. I'm gonna talk a little bit more on, on that, but we need to get something from the IRS saying they didn't file a tax return. We also need copies of their W-2s or equivalent. Um, and we need, if they're self-employed, some sort of way to build what their estimated income is gonna be. So we're gonna need all the, um, what we think might be their adjusted gross income and their taxes paid. So that's what's needed for an extension. What about amendments? So if someone filed their taxes and out of the blue, they got a W-2 they didn't expect. So we gotta go back and fix their, their tax return. They're amending it. What the financial aid office is gonna do is put them through verification. We need to know what that income was and what changed. So they're gonna say, verify your income using one of the three ways, IRS data retrieval, a copy of the tax return original, or um, a tax return transcript, but then we need to know what changed. So we also need a copy of the 1040X. The 1040X is you just saying what changed on the tax return. So that's what, how those folks handle that. One more step. What about people who were victims of tax-related identity theft? Now, these are folks that have had their identity stolen using IRS data somehow. Um, if anyone has seen when they're in the FAFSA, they try to use IRS data retrieval, but they get an error saying, you need to contact the IRS. Um, they can't use 
IRS data retrieval. So verification is not going to happen that way. They need to go back in and hand enter their data. They also can't get a tax return transcript. The IRS has locked down their stuff and getting that verification of information, um, income is going to be a little harder. So they need to request what's called a tax return database view. And there's a special um, unit within the IRS that you can call and get a copy of that um, transcript. But they also need to sign a statement saying they were a victim of identity theft with the IRS um, and that the IRS is aware of it. So they have to sign this statement. Keep in mind that this also has been difficult to receive. So the feds have said those who have tried and cannot obtain it can get a copy of the tax return or other document that has all the information to be verified. So keep in mind that that flexibility is there too. Okay, so I wanna take a second and talk about rollovers because this I think is something that get, gets missed. Um, a rollover is when we pull money out of a retirement account to put into another retirement account. So I did this when I changed my, my old job, I left my old job, I pulled out all my retirement money and I put it into my new retirement account so everything would be in one place. That's called a rollover. That showed up on my tax return. So it looks like I have a chunk of money that I can spend on college, but I don't because I rolled it over. So um, the FAFSA excludes rollover data. So you can see on the FAFSA, it says right here for um, untaxed portion of the IRA, it's gonna show up as an untaxed distribution. Um, we're gonna list amounts, except if it's a rollover. So we wanna make sure that we enter in the amount of a rollover. The financial aid office needs to get a signed statement certifying that that was a rollover. So keep in mind, Financial Aid Office may also ask about this. Okay, so that's all taxpayers. Let's talk about people who did not file a tax return and didn't have to. We need three things. We need a statement saying that they did not file a tax return and they weren't required to. We need to list out all the sources of income and the amount from each source. And we need W-2s from each one of those sources. Um, we also need to get the verification of non-filing letter. Now, this is something that comes from the IRS that says we have no record of them filing a tax return. This has been notoriously hard to get, and I feel like even during the pandemic, it's even harder. Um, if the student or parent tries to get this verification non-filing and nothing happens, or they have difficulty, um, they are able to get, do a signed statement saying, I tried to get it, but I couldn't. Um, so here is um, my statement saying, I didn't file a tax return, I'm not required to. And again, we're listing all the sources of income and how, like where it came from and how much they made. So even if we can't get that verification of non-filing letter, a signed statement will work after they try and fail. So how do we get that verification of non-filing letter? Well, remember that 4506T we used earlier? I said it was used for a bunch of different stuff. Well, this is how we request that as well. So instead of doing 6A, we're gonna check off verification of non-filing, that's box seven. We're gonna put the year that we need the information for. We're gonna check off that we're able to sign. We're gonna sign a date, put the phone number in. Now. Um, there's other ways aside from this 4506T to get that verification of non-filing. We can also go to irs.gov and do get a transcript online, but then again, you have to set up an account with the IRS. That might be difficult, but we can't use that toll-free number or also on the irs.gov website, there's a get transcript by mail. The IRS is not sending this by mail right now. Okay. Going on from this, I did want to say that if we cannot get a W-2, and so many students I'm working with right now are unable to contact their old employer, many businesses have closed, or the last one I worked with, um, the management was out on sick leave, a family emergency leave, for whatever that is, so they can't get access to someone that can send them a copy of their W-2. If that's the case, they can provide a signed statement saying the income they earn from work the source of that income and why they couldn't get the documentation. So even if they can't get a W-2, this will work instead. 
So during this period of national emergency, the feds also put out some more guidance saying that if we can't get that, we can accept a pay stub, an employment offer, direct deposit from an employer um, or other similar things. They've really made it super flexible because they realize that people are not able to get through this verification process. They can't get W-2s. So this is an alternative for that. Okay, can we send documents through email? Um, I think for a lot of people who can't get to an office because they're closed or maybe they're high risk and they're just not going anywhere, whatever the reason is, we can accept documents through email. We just wanna be sure the information that we're sending is secure. So the best way to do this is to use the student's portal to upload those documents that's already been, has some built-in security. But we could also email it to the financial aid office as long as we wanna make sure that it's password protected or encrypted in some way. Um, I also want to point out, I don't know if people are aware of the Apple technology iPhones or iPads. Using the notes section, you can actually scan documents and it creates a PDF. You can then email or um, upload a document if, if a PDF is required. So that was a, a cool can thing. I bring in for a second? Yes, please. Uh, we just had a number of questions. Um, related to what if parents are on disability. So I thought it would be good to talk for a second about how that might come into play with verification and the FAFSA. Yeah, so um, if they're getting social security disability, and I always go back to the, the actual FAFSA question, disability is not listed on the FAFSA. So many people who are on disability aren't, they're not filing a tax return because they don't have to. It's not taxable income. So it's not listed on the FAFSA. We feel good? Any other questions or anything? Okay, great. We get that question a lot too about a disability. So that's a great one. I wanna take a second and talk about students who qualify for automatic zero EFC. Now what this means is if, let's say this is a dependent student, parent information is needed on their FAFSA if the parent makes less than $27,000 a year, their income is below that threshold, and they meet one of these other qualifications, they qualify already, they're going to get maximum financial aid. They're what's called automatic zero EFC. Now, if that happens, the student's going to see this question saying, do you want to skip the remaining questions about your parents or your income and assets? So this is skipping over completely the student's income. So because of this, there is, um, it's a simplified process and we want that because these are the students we are most likely to lose, but their process for verification is simpler many times because they can't even get to the place where students would use IRS data retrieval. So their process is different. Just wanna point out that all we need for people who qualify for automatic zero EFC, if they're a dependent student, we only need to verify the parent's adjusted gross income if they were a tax filer or income earned from work if they were a non-tax filer. Hard stop, that's it. If someone is an independent student, meaning no parent information was needed on their FAFSA, we need to verify that they have dependents either children or other financial dependents other than a spouse, because that is how they get to the autumn. They have to meet those other, the low income, meet the qualifications, and they have to have dependents. If they're in that status and they qualify for automatic zero EFC, again, we just need adjusted gross income for tax filers and their spouse if they're married, or income earned from work if they're non-tax filers. I am a visual person. I just wanted to show you this is how simple this process is. This is all Department of Education is requiring. Okay. So that's verifying income. That's a good bulk of this. I want to talk about the number of people in the household because we get these questions a lot. Who's considered in the household? Because there are many different household situations. Um, Department of Education every year puts out this suggested verification text and it the school doesn't have to use it, but it just gives the school something to start with. Um, I put up what they have here for dependent students. So this includes information about the parent's household. This tells you who are we counting? We're always counting the student, we're counting the parent, 
and the step parent if that parent remarried, if they're divorced, but we're counting all the parents in that household. Um, we're going to count other children that the parents are providing more than half of their financial support. And I'm going to go to this last sentence that says, even if the child does not live with the parents. So keep in mind, if there is an older child who is at college, doesn't live at home, and can even be an independent student, if the parent is financially supporting that child, we can include them in the younger child's household. So that question, we get that a lot. Um, and then we're going to include anyone else that lives with the parents that has to live on that income. So keep in mind, Grammy and Grampy, who maybe can't live by themselves, or maybe there's, you know, a family friend that needed a place to stay. We can include them if the parents are financially supporting him. What this is doing is saying how many people have to live on that income that's on the FAFSA. We're also going to list if any of the dependents are in college, we're going to list the college they go to and if they're going to be enrolled at least half time. So this is going to count how many people live in the household and how many dependents are in college at least half time. Okay, so that was all V1. Maria, anything to add to that? Good. Uh, no, I think that you covered it. Um, just a note that each school will have its own flavor of a verification worksheet. So students should make sure that they're paying attention to communications directly from their individual colleges um, because they all have slightly different variations of that particular form. So something to keep in mind. Love it. Okay, so let's get into V1, uh, I'm sorry, V4 and V5. Now these are the folks we need to verify three things. High school completion, their identity, and a statement of educational purpose. So I want to start with verifying their high school completion status. Now the feds put out again in their list of the federal register things that we can accept to verify that a lot of times the admissions office has already gotten this information so it that might be the financial aid office's first stop um, we can use a high school diploma or it's equivalently like a high set um, we can use a transcript it has to be an official transcript that has the date the diploma was awarded um, the same thing for a foreign school, we just have to prove that it's uh, the similar to what they would get in the states. Um, their homeschool credential, we have to refer to whatever that state requires. Um, or if they didn't go to college and they are an associate program in another school and they are being successful there, we can accept that as well. So get that documentation. We then have to verify in person um, their identity. So we're going to verify we're using an unexpired government issued photo ID. So we need either a driver's license, a state ID or a passport. Um, the college is going to use a form. They're going to have someone in the financial aid office who is designated to accept this document. The student has to go there in person. They're pretty particular about this. Now think about the hurdles in normal times that this presents. Let's say I always use the example of you're going to University of Phoenix. Are you going to fly to Phoenix to go and present this documentation? Um, there are other options that we have here. Um, I also want to say that this statement of identical uh, ide statement of educational purpose, Department of Education puts out the language that schools are required to use. Schools cannot change this document. They can't. This is what they have to use. This is basically saying that I'm going to use financial aid to pay for college, and that is it. Um, so keep in mind, I did want to point out here that um, if the student can't do this in person, they can actually have a notary sign their document. So you can go find a notary public, um, have them certify their documentation, and send that to the school. Uh, I've had great luck with high school students, many times someone in the high school is a notary and they, I would just send the school uh, student back to the school and say, is there someone at your school that can do this? Um, but keep in mind also that sometimes a notary will charge to have this done. So there's uh, money now is another factor that students may have to pay to get this done. Hopefully they can get this done for free. Now keep in mind that during a national emergency, um, sometimes the students can't get into the high school. Many schools are remote right now or they can't get to a notary or they can't leave the house. 
So um, if unable, the financial aid office can get a signed and dated statement from the student um, saying that they truthfully attest to their high school completion, um, a signed and dated statement is fine. Just so you know that this is not forever. This is only gonna be going on until the end of the payment period after the national emergency ends. Okay, so I do wanna talk about th a few things that are coming up down the pike. December of 2019, um, the Future Act was passed and that did a bunch of different really good stuff, um, but also the IRS code was amended. Um, and what this was really designed to do was streamline that IRS data retrieval process and make this a lot more easy. Um, and one of the things that I was really looking forward to is that um, one of the verification things that was going to happen is that the IRS would be able to identify that no tax return was filed. Unfortunately, the IRS has ruled that out and it is not happening. I would love to see this happen. I would literally give anything. Um, so just keep in mind that this process is designed to be getting easier. I want to point out that um, every year FAME creates verification worksheets. We use the federal example, but we also try to take that language and really make it simplified and short. Um, research shows that using an eighth grade reading, um, what's the word I'm looking for here, Maria? The reading level. When you're in Microsoft Word, you can check um, spell check. And at the end of that, when spell check is done, it'll show you the, the grade level that can read this document. Eighth grade is always our target. Um, sometimes that's not gonna happen, but we try really hard. I would urge schools to like take a look at their documents to see, can we make this simpler? Can we put this in plain language? Because keep in mind that we have many people in the state where English is their second language. Um, we have some folks that have um, learning disabilities or literacy issues. So we want to make these forms as simple as possible. But for any, if any other reason, we want to make sure that phone isn't ringing in your office because they don't understand. So if you would like a copy of this form, we're happy to supply in a Word document that you can make your own. Also, Department of Education every year puts out a tax return transcript matrix. That tax return transcript looks like a bunch of just a, a bunch of words, and we're not really sure how to decode this. This is my Rosetta Stone. This is how I see the items on the FAFSA that the school is required to check. And it also tells us what the wording is that we'll find on that tax return transcript to be able to verify it. So keep in mind that that's what that is. Um, all kinds of resources out there. I've mentioned a bunch of the resources in um, my presentation. I'll send out a PDF of that. Give us a call at any time, by the way. We're happy to, to get some resources for you. But I have here also at the bottom, the verification question and answers I have found super helpful. Um, this takes a lot of the, after the guidance comes out and gets put into action in the real world, questions come up. So a lot of those really tough questions are in this question and answer. Cannot believe I did that in 44 minutes. <laughs> Maria, how are we doing? Any questions? You did awesome. Um, I took care of some stuff that was pretty specific in the chat, but I did also want to say um, this did come up about using the data retrieval tool. And so if a student is selected for verification and they're not on the one of those pathways where they can't see it, they should go back and try to use the DRT if they didn't as part of the verification process and then submit any related documentation. Um, but again, reminder that on an auto zero pathway, the student isn't going to see that functionality. So just as a reminder, if you're helping a student navigate that, a financial aid office might say, go do this, the student might not be able to see it. So and that's a, a question we get kind of annually around this time of year. Um, why can't they go back in and do that? So other than that, um, Oh, uh, yeah, I'll answer that one. So, well, we'll hang out for questions, but you did fantastic. There's nothing major. If you guys have questions on later on down the road, our phone number and email is here. Any emails that go to the education inbox, you can say send it to Nikki or Maria, and we're, we're happy to they'll forward that to us. But I also want to say to follow us on our social media. We have some awesome stuff on social media with great content. Um, the Facebook, uh, the Instagram, Maria's working super hard to make that very pretty. I love it. 
but also on our YouTube channel, we have a great, um, uh, this presentation is gonna be there along with other Wednesday webinars, but we have a great series of animated videos that you can share with your students how to set up their FSA ID. Uh, why doesn't my FSA ID work? I think it's called what the heck is wrong with my FSA ID, um, but it's basically a troubleshooting guide for people to, to get that to work. Um, how to do the FAFSA, there's a lot of great stuff out there. So go check out our social media. Anything else before we sign off? I'm just real quick gonna throw the link for the verification video into the chat so people can see that um, and then they'll be on our channel. I thank everyone for joining us today and I thank you for everything that you guys do for students. I can't tell you how crucial you are to someone's future. So I really, man, these times are hard for everyone, not just the students, for those of you that are working with students too, this is hard stuff. So I thank you very much for all of your hard work. All right, have a great day, everybody. Don't end.